Okay. It is um, Monday, April 1st. Uh, <clears throat> by the time you see this, it'll be long past Monday, April 1st. Uh, I don't know if we have any good jokes except for Joe's uh, t-shirt, uh, which we'll have to, you know, spotlight them for everybody a little bit later. Um, so we have a little bit of an agenda today. We have Eduardo, who's been working on a CPM board for the 2068. And uh, Paul sent a, um, a tape for a program called Chromasoft uh, a while back to me, and I managed to finally um, get the get the recording off of it and convert it into a P file. So it will run in 81 or any ZX81 emulator <clears throat> um, and on uh, on real hardware if you have the right adapter stuff. Uh, so we'll take a look at that um, in just a little bit. But I want to start with Eduardo because it's even later at night for him. <laughs> oh, don't worry. I will uh, be in the evening. No, no problem. I'm going to spotlight you, Eduardo. Okay. Sorry? I said I'm going to spotlight you. So you're, you're, you're all good to go. You t tell us what you've been up to. Talk to us about this CPM thing. Oh, okay. Uh, CPM, I, I, I always wanted to run CPM on the 2068. And I, I've, time before, uh, I found the Larkin RAM disk. I thought that it could be a good starting for a CPM board because it has using the 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 port um the 244 port to bank switching and i made uh, some enhancement to that board and put a um, 64 case playing ram instead of 32 and added a uh ee prom 32 case ee prom uh, to replace the the um, original ROM and to program a boot ROM that can be boot the CPM from various uh, disk system like uh, Larkin, like GLO, uh, and another system that can be programmed in, the, in that ROM. Um, I think I if I can share my screen. Yep, go right ahead. I have, do you see my screen? Yep. Um, do you want the this? GitHub link or no? That's a, or did you I, want to show us your easy EDA tab up at the top? Yep. yep. Sorry, because That's I have okay. a problem. But <laughs> I'm not a, a Mac uh, user, but here's is my the the thing is it has uh port seven to select the the banks we can have eight banks of one uh, 128k uh ram and we can select uh, each bank with a port seven and uh, select the chunk by 8k using the 244 uh, port hmm. uh in, in this case, uh, we have. I plan that because the the ULA displays the the um, the video in the internal RAM only. We can have a plain sixty four K for programs, and I think we can make a, some kind of BIOS to uh, display uh, characters in thirty two, sixty four, or eighty columns. In, in this case, and use that to create a CPN to put the 2.2 uh, from the uh, the source code uh, that is in the CPM site. Um, I can share the project with you if you want. Uh, I'm open to collaboration. Uh, I think we can uh, go further if we have. Uh, more hands on it uh, 
I think it's a good idea to to share the project. Uh, I don't know if if anyone can can share or can uh, follow my 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 project. Uh, yeah, I don't see why not. Um, I have a question for you. So, yeah. um, does your? It sounded like you said it. You can get a, a an all RAM mode, right? A sixty four K RAM mode. Yes. And is that with the um, the screen? Um, you know, memory still in the middle of it, like in chunk three or whatever it is. The thing is, the 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 starting point in the the, the board will have a um a eight flip flops that will we reset on reset of the machine and yeah. we, that that will enables the boot ROM. The okay. boot ROM will test the, the the RAM and switch to uh, the banquet system and starting to boot from disk or wherever uh, drive uh, the the system is prepared to. Uh, the thing is, the starting point is one uh, 128 uh, bank before uh, too much uh, RAM is not needed for the first time. Okay. Uh, the the thing is the 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 ROM can be enabled or disabled at at a software level the same as the banking switch the system. Hmm. Hmm. It's not very difficult to follow. This is the this part is the uh, decoding for the port seven. Yeah. This is the the flip flop and. This is the the buffer to read. The port is read and write, uh, the, not like the uh, Larkin. Larkin is read only. I mm. can read. It is better that we can read what we uh, set in that port. Uh, and the decoding is very easy because the we have the the. Sign signals in the connector to the back connector to uh, enable the the switching banks. Uh, the, the same as the uh, twenty sixty eight is doing for the, the internal ROM. The, okay. the same the same procedure. Okay. Cool. Yeah, I mean, like like you said, you know, the internal RAM is tied directly to the SCLD, so it's going to read the video data from there. But you know. I know Timex kind of didn't want chunk three, uh, you know, that had to kind of be enabled, I think, in all of the banks if you wanted to have a common code base. But I think in this case, you can forego that, right, and do what you want to do. And I guess you just write the display data back to the home chunk, right, when you need to update the display. Exactly. This is okay. the idea. Hey, Adam, you have a question? Your mic is off or something. Can you hear me now? Okay, I, uh, I so you were talking about you could. Um, oh, by the way, thanks for talking with us tonight. Uh, I, I appreciate you being here. Uh, I was wondering, you have to have a disk drive, or is this to have some way to communicate with other devices that are more modern? The 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 thing is, uh, we can program any kind of device because we have the source code of CPM. Uh, we can make a BIOS for for that device in in, in any way that we want. But those we devices can... don't exist right now. Is that right? Yeah. Right now, no, because okay. the the project is starting. But I understand. Uh, but uh, if the the solution is needed, we can program that. Uh, we I don't know if the TSP code can be accessed from. Uh, for files in 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 CPM or something like that, it could be done using the SD card in the, the TSP code, but mm -hmm. I don't know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think I think um, I think, but with I'll have to ask Ricardo. There there may be a mode that is turns off 
um, the TSP go from taking over both the dock and the um, ROM banks, in which case, in theory, you know, your ROM should then take priority. But yeah, cool. Very cool. So right now you're testing it with the, your own disk drive system. The Larkin, is that what I'm hearing? Uh, I, I... I take I t took the Larkin as a as a model, but I have a GLO. Um, I can test with that. Oh, okay, cool. All right. Well, and so yeah, the do you have a physical discs with the GLO, like the physical floppies? Yes. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Um, Willie and I had talked about trying to see if a GoTech would work with the GLO. I have a GoTech. I have GLO boards. I haven't had the time. <laughs> yes, the, the the board that I have uh, it, it made by Willy. Oh, very cool, very cool. Uh, David, hello, yeah, this is Gustavo. Can you hear me? Hi, hello, Eduardo. Congratulations hello. for your design. I, <laughs> I see very well, and and also it's good to see an expansion board on the dock. Uh, this is one of the of the request for, for the community because we have ROM on the dock, but never we see RAM except the, the TS Pico board. But this is a, the second board that the community has with RAM on the dock bank. Mm -hmm. It's very interesting because open the possibility to, to create a new new solution and new programs with with the machine. And related to the the question of the screen in the middle of the of the memory. Uh, when you use the Rothschild select signal to enable mm -hmm. the, the peripheral, you also protect the, for example, the address uh, 14 uh, for thousand in X, okay, the starting of the screen uh, to the ULA video memory, because the, the timex, the, the internal logic, insulate the external dock bank with the internal memory, memory, video memory. Okay, this is automatic. Okay, you you can run a program in the middle of the RAM without interfering the screen uh, layout or the screen info. Yeah, this is the idea. The idea yeah. is when the program needs to write in the, uh, to the screen, the, it will have uh, some code to switch back uh, and write to the screen and go back to the original color. Hmm. Exactly. For example, the Ergo CPM system, I have the Ergo solution and works in this way. The Ergo has uh, 256K in the in the dock and runs CPM with the screen in, in this memory. And the video for 80 columns or 64 columns use the the home bank or home run bank. Yep, yep, this is the idea. Uh, yeah. Another idea I have is that I, we can uh, use or, or, or put in the, in the buyer ROM uh, a code for using the, the TS2050 uh, modem uh, yeah. as well. Um, I think if we have in control of the interrupt, we can use the interrupt modify the the modem and use the interrupt to capture the the communication instead of polling uh, but it's an idea uh, eduardo let me introduce one of the points for the pico uh, in case that you try to use a cpm okay with our pico actually the system does not support two calls but it's interesting if you need for example to enable the calls for read and write in a file, okay? The, the system has the possibility to you send to the PICO the info to read and write the um, one of the virtual file or virtual disk image, okay? You can send an instruction to the PICO to please read the sector zero, track zero, hit zero, and the PICO get the info for you, okay? That is one of the possibility to interface your system with the TS Pico, okay? Okay. It's very simple. We need to add this functionality at existing uh, software. Actually, it's not supported because 
if not the, the the initial focus, okay, to run CPM on the board. But the 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 standard Pico has the ability because you can disable all the memory layout using the Pico and use only the input output communication. That could mm -hmm. be possible. It's a good idea uh, because CPM has all, all the the code needed to handle the all, the computer. Uh, functions and the only way we will need is uh, storage. Okay, uh, Eduardo, you have my contact, please call <laughs> me or send me an email and we can help to you, okay, to prepare the TSP yes. for your board. Yes, sure. Very cool. Okay. That's that's hilarious. I, I, um, I, I think I, I, I can stop sharing oh, I did. my- I stopped sharing you, yeah. Um, and and to me the the part that is amazing about this is you know that the you and Gustavo and Ricardo are in Argentina you know and <clears throat> there's a couple of us you know here in the here in the states who are doing similar kinds of stuff um, this would not have been possible you know there's certainly not a, not not with this this ease uh, you know ages and ages ago. <clears throat> Very cool. Thank you. Thank well, you. Edward. The newsletters uh, did allow people to make projects together, right? Back in the eighties. Well, you know, I mean, not like would have, quite, you would have but... had to have sent letters to each other. Yeah. You know, um, I mean, and we don't know how to write letters anymore, so darn it. <laughs> well, and there was email. You know, I don't know how email would have gotten in eighty four. I don't know how email would have gotten from Argentina to oh, I... to the states unless there was, you know, copy sir. Just That's what I, was, exactly what I was thinking is if CompuServe had some dial-up access in, in Argentina, maybe. Yeah. Yeah, very bizarre. <clears throat> um, all right, Adam, are you ready? There's still some content on Usenet or the, you know, the old ARPANET. Well, but that was just the United States, ARPANET. Yeah, but the bulletin board's carrying some of the feeds. Uh, Usenet was pretty much international. Argentina was... Not in, in the internet world, well, 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 the, the the communication we have we have modems, 300 modems, uh, very slow to to share anything uh, remotely. No, <laughs> it was it's what and enough for double. Uh, no, no, it's crazy in that in that in that year. Yeah. And the other, Did you say it was unaffordable? Thing... Unaffordable, yeah. yeah. The other thing too is a lot of those newsletters, you know, they would but post. Usenet um, did go across universities and was available to some people. Yeah, but most of that was in the states, wasn't it? I mean, in in eighty four ish. Well, I didn't mean to bog us down in semantics there. I was just wondering, like, well, how if if there are projects that were created through the newsletters, kind of. But that's another yeah. topic altogether. Yeah, that's like I was saying. There is, there were, and they they would post a lot of them. Would post PC board layouts, right? That you could copy, and you would have to make your own boards back then. There weren't, <laughs> it wasn't as easy to make PCBs back then as it is now. Yeah, yeah. Well, as a matter of fact, um, <clears throat> somebody in uh, the Toronto user group came up with a design for a circuit that would let you do a. Uh, capture black and white one level you know uh capture from uh vh uh, vhs no not vhs from a composite video signal and um if you had like a you know one of those uh you know vcr cameras back in the day you could have hooked it up that's what folks did <clears throat> uh and then that somehow made it through newsletters to the michigan group who did a whole bunch more work on it and it also ended up in the um, Cleveland newsletter. Hmm. So the, the same schematic, you know, sort of made its way around via newsletters and <clears throat> and stuff. So, um, as I said at the start, um, I don't know how we got on this subject, you know, in a prior meeting, but uh, there was a guy uh, Bill Russell, who had a company um, selling little doodads for the 1000 originally, and then for the 2068. And the the main 
um, thing that he was known for was this thing called the Winky board. It was this little tiny circuit board. It had a couple of resistors on it, a couple capacitors, and a couple of LEDs. <clears throat> and you would plug your tape player into the Winky board and the Winky board into your ZX81 or 1000. You know, and you'd crank the volume up until the LEDs like blinked at the right rate or something. And then that would give you a good load. You know, it would, it would guarantee that the, 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 whatever the program was, was going to load into your computer. <clears throat> For those of us who did not have the Winky board back in the day, loading programs on the 1000 was, um, was an experience. <laughs> uh, it was a very difficult experience. <clears throat> so anyway, um, Bill started this company selling these Winky boards first for the 1000. And then there was other stuff that he sold. Um, and he wrote this program called Chromasoft. And he advertised it as giving you color on the, on the um, 81 slash 1000. And it used this rapidly flashing images to fool your eye into possibly seeing some color also came with a little overlay we don't know what color the overlay was because we haven't we don't have that but what we do have is the tape that um paul holmgren uh found in his massive collection that lives in his home <clears throat> or he lives with in his home um <clears throat> and and so paul sent me the tape and i actually managed to record it on the first pass and i loaded it into um into that that uh java program that um joe uh demonstrated for us a couple of meetings ago uh and it loaded on the first try i didn't have to do any of the bit manipulation that that joe spent months doing i was i was a little bit surprised so uh this is slowed down i don't know how much it's slowed down let's see playback speed half okay so this is in theory half the uh the regular frame rate um and the reason i'm doing this is because there's going to be a lot of flashing and if flashing is going to be an issue for you uh maybe skip ahead five minutes <laughs> um all right so let me share my screen uh there it is uh so this is a, a screen capture of 81 uh a zx 81 emulator uh it's actually pretty nice it's my favorite emulator for archiving software <clears throat> and so i just did a little screen grab here of the loading process it fakes it out so you can see what i mean by flashing right and it's a little hard to tell i don't think i'm quite seeing the fake color at this speed so i'm going to pause it and I'm going to play it at normal speed. And I'll tell you what I saw is I see the word chroma in. I see red for chroma. You see red. I'm seeing a yellowish. Yellow. Yellow yeah. green. It's like a yellowish red for me. All right. Let me back it up a little bit. This is crazy. <laughs> yeah. It's hard to tell. And and the oh, and the. um, The stripes. Oh, and the colors oh. on the color bars are all changing. Yeah. Okay, what see? the hell? Isn't that bizarre? How is it doing that? Well, it's it's not it's not it doing it, it's us. because uh, if I if I stop here in the middle of a of a frame, I wonder if I can oh sweet, I can advance uh, right. Okay, so here's what it looks like. Um not quite a frame at a time, but you can see how it's it's just black and white on every image. It's just black and white, but it's flashing it so fast that it looks yeah it's working and it looks like yellow and red and blue and green in those color bars at the top okay okay i see some yeah oh yeah wow. i get the blue i get the blue now okay isn't that because i'm an influencer you see you see the blue <laughs> <laughs> well i wasn't looking before <laughs> it did exactly the same very, thing very with a black and white see monitor. color at all oh really oh i'm sorry what I said I must have weird eyes because I don't see any color at all. Thank you, David. <laughs> that cataracts get operated on like I did. <laughs> That's coming way too soon for me, Paul. <laughs> so I, you know, maybe it looks even better with 
with some kind of filter. I can't imagine what would. Now, I, my question is, is it going to look better on a CRT? I think so. Okay. I think so because of the, the persistence of the phosphor. Sure. You know, on the CRT versus what we experience with. Um... But there's no way to record it in color then, right? Unless you can no. record my eyeball. <laughs> I, I can't imagine how you would how you would record it in color. Yeah. Yeah. Because um, it just doesn't. Well, <clears throat> well Carl is, uh, is going to come over sometime soon. And um, he fixed a 1000 that got messed up with the keyboard. And so I will try it if no one else tries it first on a, a real CRT. Although I'm going out of town. So maybe by the next meeting, I'll be a, I can say if I had a seizure or I saw color or, mm. or both. You know. do, you, do you have a black and white um oh well does oh it has to be on a black and white tv doesn't have to be it just does it reacts the same way on black and white oh okay it does. i do actually have a black and white five inch screen that's from made in 1976. i would try but, that um, I, would oh, try I can that. try it on both yeah yeah i have no clue what the filter color should be i mean there's no i there's seem nothing to recollect the... amber oh an amber you think yeah, I, I seem to recollect it was basically a theater gel. Okay. All right. What does that mean, a theater gel? It's a film they put over uh, the big spotlights. The lights. To get the color. They call it a gel, but it's really, you know, a thin piece of mylar or something that's colored. Yeah. Hmm. But they call they call them gels. I mean, you can get them at, uh, at places that, you know, do that kind of thing. They become in all colors. Yeah, just I guess the same color. thing would work if you wore like an amber colored glasses. Maybe. Take a shot. Maybe. Oh. Maybe we're getting be, amber. Could it also be influenced by the type of connection you've got between your computer and your uh, your monitor? Like I have a... Uh, oh, why do I always get this mixed up? Uh, HDMI? connection maybe it requires a, a, a ygb connection or something that simulates that well i'm sure most of this was designed for just the, like either the rf that comes out or, or composite yeah i would imagine yeah, yeah. Same. well originally it was rf yeah 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 well one thousand. you know you had to modify that for composite Right, that's right. You did have to mod it if you wanted to composite. Right, so so there you go. Uh, you know, you want to do some color, and there's there's instructions. You, if you can, you know, once you get past that screen, it's not entirely clear to me how you get to the instructions because I just hit space and ran the program again, and then it gives you, um, you know, some pretty cryptic instructions about. Well, drawing there's instructions things. in the program itself. You mean? Yeah, I not see. too helpful. <clears throat> um, well, that was 1980s. I guess. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'll let's see here. Oh, I do have it. I wonder if I have. Uh, let's see if I have the program loaded. Well, I don't know. I think a lot oh. of documentation back then was actually more, you know, uh, technical. Mm -hmm. Stuff we get today is just so watered down. You know, it's really hard. This is true. Oh shoot! Now I just lost my eighty-one screen. Oh well, never mind. <laughs> Um, yeah, so that was, uh, you know, read the instructions. Someone can figure out how to make drawings in it or whatever. So that's <clears> the point? Like you can make a, a like an animation or something? Uh, like I think, some... well, certainly, yeah, that was animated. So yeah, you should be able to make animations. I, I guess it was animated. It wasn't a Warner Brothers cartoon, but yeah, I guess so. <laughs> <laughs> it did like the scintillating dialogue, yes. <laughs> Well, thank you for recording that. And I, I'm really surprised it worked with this video here that we're just watching now. So Yeah, I'd be curious to see how it comes out on um, on YouTube. You know. Yeah, I was kind of like... Over a video for flashing lights or something. <laughs> I was probably... I was more like with David there where I, I kind of could see something, but it was, yeah, mostly just, you know, flashing black and white to me. But I mean, the, the chroma was like a... I don't know, like a faint... Some kind of faint color I was getting out of that. But yeah. Yeah, I think it would definitely be better on a CRT. Yeah, yeah, with the persistence of of the the phosphor. And is that written in BASIC or is that written in machine language? There's um, 
there's uh three rem lines of machine code that are a screen and a half in total long so like you know lines one and two show up and then if you want to see the rest you got to start your listing at number three and then you see the other uh you know the rest of the code it's it's uh pretty crazy yeah as fast as it was flashing i would think it would have to be machine code i don't think basic could pull that off that fast <laughs> <laughs> all right let's see if i can get this to, I'll, I'll see if i can bring this up and show you the code <clears throat> uh okay good it is loading well when we're doing that hey carl Yoo-hoo. uh oh i see a bunch of membranes and they're the real deal yes they are are they the original ones from 80 yes Nice. Are they the Timex 1000 ones? <laughs> yes. Oh, beautiful. Beautiful. Those are those are kind of rare, I guess, or maybe not. I don't know. Anybody just doesn't seem to really pay attention to that. That you know, because I know I had the one from Stored, and when you look at it, there's nothing on the on the keyboard that really makes any. It still says copyright 1980 up on the top. The only di- difference is right is when you look at the enter key and the and the delete key, that's that's the only thing that tells you it's for the 1000. There's no part number difference or anything like that. So I think a lot of people, they don't really realize that. And, uh, you know, I, I know Stuart was telling, you know, telling us that he didn't even think about that. And that when he did look that he did see that he had a few. But, uh, well, I'd certainly be interested in a few of those because I know I had to use one on, like I said, Adam's, uh, you know, his keyboard went out. And uh, I had to use, I guess uh, Ryan had bought one already and I used that one, but it's for an 80, a ZX81, right? It has the, the new line and the rub out. Plus it was thicker. It's a thicker keyboard than the original. Um, oh, really? Yeah, so it kind of uh, sticks up a little bit more. I mean, it's not supremely thick, but it's probably, you know, maybe a, a quarter, maybe a half of the thickness of the original, thicker. You don't understand what I'm saying? So, uh, and I think that has to do with the material it's made out of because, you know, when you look at the tails, the keyboard tails are clear. Yeah. Right? They're clear. You can see through them. Whereas on the original material that Sinclair was using, you know, that's it's opaque. You can't see through it. That's you know, right. it's kind of it's kind of clear, but you can't see through it, you know. Cloudy. Right. Yeah. You, you know, the, the one that I got or the Ryan got or in the ones I have seen from like R.A.W.P. over in the U.K., you know, those that they have that the Mylar is totally clear. You can see, you know, perfectly through it. Cool. I'm going to I'm going to share my screen here so you guys, you guys can see the um, menu and whatnot. <clears throat> uh, so. You hit this this. Well, I'm going to go to the, the help. So to, to answer your question, Adam, multiple color paintings, and even paintings is in quotes. Right. <laughs> <laughs> the admission here is <clears throat> um, <clears throat> the strength of the colors depends on the position and the right, right. And it tells you that you have to have special uh, lighting. I'm going to fully lit room and it worked for me. Yep. Right. Exactly. Um, all right. So my level of fatigue. How interesting. Right. Uh, and then, so I'm going to do B and then it, this is where we need a manual because it says, you know, for coded straight method, yeah, um, or for direct screen, direct screen drawing, but it doesn't tell you how to do the direct screen drawing or does it? Use the arrow keys. Oh, hit the zero to erase, the one to draw, enter when finished. All right. All right. Well, let's see. Um, arrow keys. I wonder if the arrow keys, let's should get a little. Oh, so it's a paint program sort of. Yeah. Well. And I'm trying, but shift five, six, seven, eight doesn't do anything. I just did a one, so it drew something, but I can't. Um... We can probably figure this out at a later time. Yeah. Yeah. So anyway, good times. Pretty, pretty. Um, I expect if only we to had, back... If only Timex had made a, a later computer that did show color. Right, right. <laughs> without, without inducing seizures. I wonder how that would happen. <laughs> <clears throat> uh, 
what technology could be done to do that? Would have been nice if they would have built it with an actual video controller chip in it. But hey, what mm. can you do? <laughs> Details. <laughs> Details. Hey, Jeff K. <clears throat> yeah. You, uh, you're going to be up here in my neck of the woods. Yes, in say, August. Buffalo in late August, the 24th, yes. specifically. Um, and you had inquired about any kind of uh, vintage computing activities yes. uh, going on. <clears throat> um, people have, have not, not everybody understands where Buffalo is in, in New York State. We are nowhere near Manhattan. <clears throat> um, we're at the other end of the state. <laughs> uh, and I'm not aware of anything, you know, locally uh, going on. But um, there's a guy uh, um, who lives about 20 miles from me. And I go hang out with him once in a while. He doesn't join the Zoom meetings, um, Dane Stegman. <clears throat> uh, but I bet I could get Dane to come into town and bring some of his uh, doodads. Okay. Um, and I'm thinking, uh, there's, there's a couple folks in, um, Ontario, just over the, just over the border who we might be able to arm wrestle to come to Buffalo. Uh, <clears throat> flights are cheap guys, you know, uh, Buffalo is pretty in the, you know, in the summer I Can show you the falls, you know, <clears throat> I'm sure we could figure something else out to do. <laughs> <laughs> We have wings. By the way, they're, they're just wings here. What uh, do you mean, just wings? Those those things that come on, you know, attached to chickens. Oh. <laughs> it's like English muffins. Yeah. Right. Uh, they're just well, muffin, muffins here. <laughs> yeah, buffalo, buffalo wings is sort of redundant. We have buffalo wings uh, chain, whatever that thing, that thing is called. We have them here. I, I, of all things, in Buffalo, we have those th those oh, of course you do. restaurants. Um, so we might, we might be able to shake a few, you know, shake a few people together, uh, Jeff. Yeah, I'd appreciate it. And like I said, I'm trying to meet with um, Adam next week. It's just it's kind of a weird time because um, I'm not sure if I make it over to the Dallas area or not. But I thought it'd be yeah. cool if I could make it over to Dallas, kind of meet. Um, Adam kind of talk about some of the uh, retro computing things and then the fact that the concert's up in your neck of the woods. I've never really been to New York and that's why I thought kind of tied going to a concert at that uh, local music hall or um, theater with, you know, the retro computing thing be kind of nice. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And you're you're in Louisiana, right? Yes. Okay, okay. That's a bit of a drive over to Dallas. Yeah, about three and a half hours. Or oh, it depends on where in Dallas, but yeah. Yeah. Three, three and a half hours. Hell if I know, somewhere. <laughs> it's a big damn city. <laughs> hey, Paul, don't play around with those too much, man. <laughs> <laughs> Just you know, something I've discovered. Anticipation. You know, yeah. David, have you discovered this uh, about uh, your area? Because when we're, we're going to be in Dallas, we can't even rent a car, it turned out, because everything was already prevented because of the eclipse. And uh, oh. I mean, you're not renting a car up there, but like, no, it, but it, are... it is everything is booked. Everything is it's crazy right now. Yeah, yeah, we're we're and we're smack in the middle of the path too. Yeah, it, so it's, it's gonna be like three thirty for us. Um, and the the southern Ontario, the portion that I was just talking about, has already declared a state of emergency because of the number of folks coming. What? Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. I, mean, I don't know what that means for them, but that's what they've done. Well, well Carmel, that's Ontario is right, right in the middle of a full eclipse, and yeah. there's been all kinds of warnings about uh, not looking up in the sky during the full eclipse unless you're wearing these um, yeah, the, the, the uh, glasses, glasses that black out everything. Uh, I just plan to hide downstairs with my two pointy cats. I think it's because uh, it's time for a lot of the places where kids are getting out of school they'd be might be unsupervised yeah could be well plus i don't know how often this eclipse per se happens right because that's usually the draw for these things is it's you know it's it's years between times when they happen so 
Yeah, it's gonna be like forty years until the next one, I guess. Yeah. Well, full. they happen much well, more often than that, but in, in yeah, twenty they years again, a lot and, is just yeah. rare. Right. Yep. Exactly. Yeah. 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 And plus, well, if it's a full, right? If it's a full eclipse, like I, I believe this one is, because there's a bunch of partial eclipses that aren't really as as interesting, I suppose, as yeah. the full eclipse. Yeah. Last full, full one was in 2017. I flew to Missouri to see it. Oh, did you? I think we had not so full here in Buffalo. I mean, we got the Crescent. Uh, speaking of Tim, I'm glad you spoke up because I was going to just mention that you've been digging up all sorts of things from uh, Bill's collection and um, things that we didn't have. And I, I've been putting up on putting them up on the um, on archive. One of the things that you dug up, Tim, was uh, a manual for something called TS Count. And that was an accounting package that a guy named Jim Payne wrote for the um, the 1000. <clears throat> and I had actually talked to Jim. Uh, he found he found himself on, on my website a, a number of years ago. And we, we chatted uh, a few years back, I think, before the pandemic. And so I, I forwarded the uh, the manual you sent to him, and it, it you know he almost fell out of his chair. <laughs> as he put it, <laughs> he was really pleased to see that. Um, and he's going to try to join us uh, yeah. on one of our upcoming meetings, which would be really good uh, because he um, not only did he write software, but he um, was one of those mail order guys that you know ran a company. He ran a company called Phoenix Enterprises. But the phoenix was misspelled. It was mm -hmm. EO or oh, whichever, half, whichever the I'm guessing, whichever the wrong spelling is, the or, wrong order of the O E E O. I'd have to look it up. Um, and he said he got a lot of grief for that. <laughs> oh, he didn't misspell it on purpose. Uh, no, oh. no, he misspelled it because he didn't know how to spell phoenix. I see. <laughs> Probably confused the O E. <laughs> And and I guess once you've committed to such a thing, remarkable. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. What was that, Tim? Or if you misspell it, that's trademarkable. Then. Oh, true. It wasn't trademarkable. Yeah. Right. Um, it was a ph because I remember seeing it on the document. Yeah, and then um, you came up with a listing of the ROM for the ANJ Microdrive. 2000 so this would have been the rom you know the unit you plugged into your 2068 and um and then i i sent that off to gustavo and gustavo uh you know wrote me back and said this is the same way that the pico works by rewriting that little routine the tape save routine and the tape load routine which was pretty cool <clears throat> um but it also answered this question that um gustavo had asked me quite a while ago and i didn't have an answer at the time which was did timex um did the folks at a and j know about you know how timex was doing the micro drive thing and was there any kind of communication between you know a and j and, and timex and given the fact that we have the we now have the source from uh from lawn for the timex solution with the micro drives and we have the A and J solution. We can, you know, definitively say no, no such thing. <clears throat> and 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 also, I don't know its possibility to get the binary of the ROM of this system, because uh, I don't know if exists any interface that has the the ROM well working. That leads me to back to Carl. Thank you, Carl. Oh. <laughs> didn't did Tim send you? Uh, uh, a 2000 system, ang 2000. I believe so. I mean, I already had one. I had bought one on eBay because, like I said, I had used it way back in the day with with uh, the stuff that Art was doing. You know, he had a he had an A and J uh, 2000 that I'm pretty sure is what I was using to save all my diagnostic cartridge stuff to. Okay. I don't really recall saving it to tape, and I know I had that thing. Yeah. And uh, um, and I know it was a 2000 because it looks different, right? Um, it's a different case. The yeah. 1000 is kind of like the original Intrepo drives. Um, and that also has an interface, right? So they, they both have interfaces. Uh, obviously, they're not compatible with one another. But yeah, there is a ROM on there. And I think there's room for another ROM because it had the printer port on the 2000 version. And I think it needed a, 
a ROM for that. So yeah. it didn't necessarily, I don't think mine had that, but there was a spot on the board, I believe, for it. But yeah, I, I, I know I do have the interface. So I could probably pull the EEPROM off of it and, and dump it. Yeah, that'd yeah, be great. No, the idea is because we have the source code, the full source code, but it's in the 8080 assembly code. And I, the, the idea is to not retype all the full source code, okay, in C80, mnemonic. That is the idea to see if we have the binary and also create it or process those files and obtain a C80 source code. That is the idea. So you said the source code was originally written in 8088? Well, no, it's written in with 80. an assembler that uses uh, uh, yes. Intel. Yeah, like a, like a CPM, exactly. Like a CPM. Oh, manual. it was written it in 8080 80 code, probably. 8080 80 80. mnemonics. Yeah. Yes, yes, yeah. Not the Z80 mnemonics. It's using the 8080 mnemonics. Okay. Exactly. Yep, yep, yep. exactly. Um, but that's Which is extremely dangerous. common back then. I don't know. I mean, I recognized I recognized the name of the um, the compiler. Uh, let's see. Because here. the CPM had the had an eighty eighty compiler with it, right? Am I? Well, but CPM like, was written for the eighty eighty, right? Um, and if you wanted to write software for it for the CPM systems that would be most compatible, you had to write it in eighty eighty, so it would run on the Z eighty and the eighty eighties. Yeah, I want to yeah. show. I'm going to show well, the Z80 thing. obviously had a lot of commands, right? I mean, opcodes that the uh, Z, the 8080 didn't even have. Right. So yeah, you know. yeah. So here's that um, here's that disassembly, or I guess assembly code rather. Uh, and this, you know, in the upper hand corner, that's Bill Miller's handwriting. I recognize it from his. A uh, funky little newsletter that he did called Sync Link, I think. Um, so Bill got this in June, June twenty first of eighty five. Yeah. yeah, from Jim Howell, who was, um, if I recall correctly, he was the son of the person who started Exatron, and he spun the 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 little you know uh, stringy floppies off to a, a company called a and j <clears throat> um and so somebody named jim maynard wrote this stuff but i remember this avocet um systems assemblers i remember seeing ads for that a long long time ago um uh, what's kind of puzzling to me is it says it's a z80 assembler and yet gustavo you're saying that the um let me get ahead to the, some actual code here oh yeah you're right geez that is uh yep. moves and yeah, LXIs, L H L D S and S H L D S mm -hmm. and moves. Yeah, like you said. Yeah, moves and whatever Anna is. I don't even know what that is. <laughs> um yeah. But no, uh, I, I understand the eighty eighty code, but the problem is the compiler. I use a tool I, I, I don't like to use the, the CPM tools again. <laughs> It's, it's hard to <laughs> so nobody hard to nobody them. has yeah. dumped nobody has dumped the a and j roms then no. or eproms That's really correct. okay hmm. yeah yeah carl it all rests on you <laughs> you're our only hope <laughs> yeah. well plus you know i'm sure there's there's obviously different versions of it you know so i don't know what versions i have i think i think tim sent me a 2001 and then like i said i have i have another one so They'll, they'll probably have different versions of ROM, so that'd be kind of nice. Cool. Um, Carl, since you're since you're on screen for me, uh, do you want to give us a little update on your your activities? Well, you know, work has kind of been kicking me in the ass these last two weeks, but you know, in the little downtime I've had, I've got the um, let's talk about the Z80 clone thing for a little bit right i, I did yeah. post a thing about that where uh uh you know i did get it working there's a document that the guy posted in the github that uh, you know says well you know if you have some video problems maybe put some pots on these couple of resistors and try to adjust them and that's kind of what i did and uh, oh. I, I get it to display you know you can 
you can see the pixels start to come in when you start, you know, I guess getting the resistance value lower. And I was like, well, what the hell does that do? You know, you look on the schematic yeah. and it actually goes to the clock line of the shift register that, that loads the pixel data. So it's like uh, you're, I don't know, you're you're like lowering the level of the clock instead of, you know, I don't know. I, I'm not, I have to put an O-scope on it to see what it's actually really doing to that line. But I guess the original resistance I had in there, which is what is called for on the board, I think was too high. Mm-hmm. So it was just white. I, I would just kind of barely get a little line that I could see. But then once I put the pot on there, started adjusting it around and, oh, yeah, it would start coming in. <laughs> you know, the lower you would get it, the more, you know, it would get in. Except I noticed on the Ys, it's like the very first pixel on the, you know, the Y is mm-hmm. still kind of not fully black, right? It's and I don't know why it's only on Y, yeah. Um, well, it's got the jumper on it, too, where you can display uh, white on black. Yeah. or black on white right yeah. it just it's just the it's the uh intensity. well it's coming off of the not or or you know the inverse or the true logic of the shift register because it has two outputs right it's got true and it's got invert and so that's what the that jumper connects to it either connects to true output or it connects to the inverted output okay so um uh, but anyway, so that I got that to work. And then, like I said, I bought the 3D printed cases. Uh, and I think Adam made a comment that he couldn't really tell if it was, you know, a real oh, yeah, one or not. Real or, 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 <laughs> you know, that's pretty cool. And the pictures, it looks authentic to me. Was it right? Was it filament or resin uh, printed? It was filament. So it kind of, okay. to me, I would rather it be resin because, you know, those seem to turn out much better to me. Um, but they're, you know, the, the filament is cheaper, you know, and yeah. I just wanted to see, plus, you know, filament, uh, or filament kind of can, can warp easier when yeah, you're doing flex. the prints, right? Yeah. So yeah. the top cover kind of is a bow on it. So, but, you know, I haven't drilled the holes to put the little rivets in, you know, to, to, to hold that thing together. Um, oh, oh so have, not like I, the bow you get on top of your car. No. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I made a joke. <laughs> <laughs> in fact, in fact, I printed uh, I printed two of those uh, Pico uh, um, cases oh. out. Oh, the enclosure that John did. Yeah, and the top piece is bowed. The bottom okay. piece, it's like when they printed it, they printed it with the back on the on the bed. Yes. So that one's pretty. That one's pretty stable. That one's pretty rock solid. The the top piece, I don't know. They must have printed it standing up. Okay. You know, so the bottom of it was on the bed, but, you know, that's just a sliver of, of material that's on the bed. You know, yeah, they should yeah. have probably printed it forward, but then it's got the, the Fox vents that are kind of in there on the, you know, like matching yep. the 2068. And maybe that was yep. going to be a problem printing it that way. I don't know. Hmm. Um, so that it looks like they printed it. And I had this done at a, at a, at like a print house. I don't know. It's a cloud cloud craft or craft cloud or something like that and they kind of work with a bunch of different 3d printers in the country right and just get the cheapest price and what material you want it anyway i actually should show that i don't have any pictures of it because i painted it silver uh and i painted the little buttons you know because he had the little buttons yeah uh, 3d printed as well and i printed the uh i painted those different colors you know i think one's red one's black and one's gray so it kind of depends on which one um but i i got two of those one for me and one for adam because i know he's got one of those things and of course i have one yeah uh of course i still haven't worked on getting mine to work (laughs) i need (laughs) to do that to load the firmware on that thing but uh uh i do have the case for it but anyway going back to the zx80 thing it does work i haven't hooked the chroma up i've got to get the cable because that uses scart yeah right it has a scart output on it so it's rgb scart uh, so I'm thinking of getting a, they make an RGB SCART 2 Sega Genesis 2 adapter, just straight. So I could plug that thing into that Sega. Yeah, by the uh, way, Carl, I, you should just come over and borrow that sucker. Well, I, I have a couple here because I was oh. working on that thing to get the, uh, well, I guess it's probably worthless now, but maybe still some point to do it, to get the RGB out of the or, 26.8 directly into that Commodore monitor or the Amiga monitor that you have. Oh, yeah, the 1020. Right, since it, since it does have RGB input on the back. Mm-hmm. Of course, we wouldn't get the intensity bit, but now we've got the Pico video board. So, I, you know, I, I don't really know. There's a lot of... Uh, 
energy that really can go back into that. But anyway, so they do make a cable, and that's what I originally bought, but I had, I cut it up. I desoldered it and everything, so I could just buy another one. But it comes with the other adapter on the end, so I should be able to just plug it right into the uh, uh, that uh, Hyperkin. <clears throat> and hopefully, hopefully, I'll get an RG, you know, I'll get an HDMI output of that ZX80, <laughs> which would be kind of cool. Not to put, you know, more um, things on your on your potential plate, but I came across this uh, project, which looks to be, I don't know, at least a year old, uh, and it implements uh, the 81 and the 80 on the Raspberry Pi Pico. Mm, okay. Um, I'm just going to share screen because it's got some cool pictures. I got to make sure I'm on the right screen. Ooh, there we go. Okay, <clears throat> so um, like it says, you know, 81 uh, and 80 emulator on the Raspberry Pi Pico. Uh, it supports VGA, HDMI, DVI, mm -hmm. LCD, <clears throat> um, uh, pseudo and high-res graphics, Zonix and Quicksilver soundboards, uh, these various user-defined graphics. Um, Adam, I remember you asked a question about what we were talking uh, in in email about the group side IO list rather about uh, these user defined graphics, the Quicksilver stuff. Uh, does the eighty, the Chroma eighty and eighty one, <clears throat> um, loads all the standard file formats, mm -hmm. right? It's funny that you say, "Hey, look, it's showing a, a con game." But it's funny that you say standard file formats because when uh, I was together with Ryan the other day, he was talking about how like maybe the dot p standard isn't as standard as we think it is or oh maybe yeah, yeah. good point but anyway um so right like you said kong is this is this one of the kongs that we identified no it is not no okay so this one's by it <laughs> says it's by paul farrow who's the huh. um yeah he's the creator of the 81 emulator and, it, and all the chroma stuff okay yeah yeah um so there's a that looks like a 3d printed case just i'm going based on the graininess of the bottom of the case yeah definitely that looks like, that looks like a 3d printed case definitely <clears throat> um but look you know there's a little on little uh, lcd uh screen there's some high ish res uh and i guess it works with all these different weird adapter boards that will you know put out uh, uh video signals there's that there's that Chroma mode. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Oh, look, and color, um, whatever game that is. <clears throat> Galaxian. Uh, it's Galaxian. Yeah. yeah. It looks like a Galaxian, doesn't it? Yeah. <clears throat> so there you go, Carl. More things to do with your not much free time. <laughs> <laughs> well, it is kind of cool that, uh, you know, like on this, on the thing that I built, you know, he has a big ROM in it, right? The ROM in it is 512K. So basically, it has eight different ROMs that you can switch in. It's got a dip switch on the bottom. So you can switch in one of eight different ROMs. And there's like, I think there's two ZX80 ROMs, and then there's a bunch of ZX81 ROMs. Yeah. Uh, I kind of want to put an 80, a 1500 ROM in there so I can see if it'll boot up the uh, 1510 and run, auto run uh, the cartridge. Uh, so that's kind of one thing I want to put in there. But other than that, you know, the 81 mode seems to work. Oh, I kind of didn't mention about the keyboard because I know. I can't remember who it was, but, uh, you know, we've Rich. been talking on email. Yeah. That he wanted, uh, well, he's in Canada and it was like, yeah, I bought these little Old adhesive. Dogs. Yeah. That, well, the adhesive, uh, stickers. Yeah. Right. And it's made out of this 3M 7449, I don't know, material, but it's what, if you go to these dome manufacturer sites here in the States, yeah, that's what they recommend you use as the adhesive to stick down those domes. I don't know how true that is, you know, because the domes flex, right? So if you use like packing tape or scotch tape or something like that, those things aren't really designed to flex a lot. So they may break, you know, over, over usage, they may split or whatever. And, and Amazon had these domes and they were like, I don't know, six or seven bucks for a hundred. Okay. So it was like, okay. So I got like three packs of them because, you know, I've got five boards. So that's <laughs> like 200 and, 200, 250 domes, or I don't know, I got to stick down. But um, anyway, that's where the pictures, you know, you see the pictures. I had some pictures that I 
kind of started putting the domes down and you can kind of see a close up of it and uh, it seems to work pretty well, you know, and I printed out the keyboard layout and stuck some tape over that. So, you know, it's not just paper uh, and it works pretty good. You know, I have to admit that, uh, uh, you know, that, that that's a nice little thing. And I, I just remember that he was mentioning that it would cost a lot more to get those to Canada because of the shipping, you know, than other than to us. And he was like, and I hadn't got my domes yet and I thought they were lost in the mail, but they actually eventually showed up here. And so, uh, you know, I, I need to get touch base with him. Uh, and then, you know, I could probably send him some, some of those domes, like in a, in like in a letter. Right. I mean, I mean, it's, I don't think they need to have any kind of, uh, customs over a letter. Well, envelope, you know, but it, it, so, okay. Uh, this is a good segue. Um, if you asked me for a, uh, oh shoot, I put them away. If you asked me for one of those uh, uh, reproduction Timex computer club cards that I had made up, <clears throat> I put those in envelopes today, except yours, Carl, is going in a box directly to you. So Adam, right. I'm sending you three, but the third one's for Brian. Nope, <laughs> nope. No? They're all mine. <laughs> They're all yours, okay, sorry. <laughs> all <right>. um, <clears throat> anyway, uh, Rich had asked for a couple, one for himself and one for his grandson. Now I put everybody else's in, you know, just regular number six style envelope, and I just mm -hmm. stuck a stamp on it because it's well under an ounce. Okay, I don't feel like dealing with. I don't feel like going to the post office and dealing with, you know, the um, customs form that you have to fill out and stick on a letter, which you have to do. Ooh. So I stuck it in an envelope and I purchased a very expensive label from a uh, pirate ship <laughs> um <clears throat> you, you're you're maybe go to the post office and maybe they'll let you send it for under several dollars i don't know it, it, shipping to canada is ridiculous utterly ridiculous hmm. As, yeah because i know that he was like well i could send you some domes and you could send me some of those stickers uh you know I don't really need the domes now, but, you know, I certainly don't, you know, I've got extra stickers that I could send him. Yeah. Um, so that he can get his going <clears throat> as well. I think yeah. his board is older than mine because he doesn't have the, because we were talking about, how'd you hook a keyboard up to it? So, well, it has the, it has those five and eight connectors that yep. you know, like a 1000 has. So you just populate those and uh, you can hook a, you know, 1000 keyboard up to it. Yeah. You know, so. Um, oh, there's Rich. Rich, we were just talking about you. <laughs> yeah. Well, my, my, you cut in and out and everything. And <laughs> anyways, I got some progress done on my ZX80. Those, yeah, your those connection's not that great, I think, Rich. <laughs> about? Very choppy. Yeah, that's that. That's what I get here yeah, too. Maybe you didn't um, pay the uh, pay the fees for the over the over the border for the internet. <laughs> Cross border fee. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I you know if it's okay, maybe we can move on. Um, I know that uh, Brian has been doing some work. If that is that okay, if we move on. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, hey, Ryan, are you there? Good segue into because I didn't really talk about the fifteen ten too much because you know I, I did get some time to build more of those and uh, um, you know, and this I think is what you're kind of getting to right is that uh, Ryan's working on the yeah absolutely program yeah, to convert yeah. uh, convert more pro because I sent him the high the hot Z stuff that uh, Joe sent me, um, and. I'll probably have to upgrade my internet connection because my upload speed is like maybe two megabits. You know, it's, it's a, it's a dial up thing or well, not dial up, but it's a DSL. Right. So, um, it, it was going to take a long time and I was doing some other stuff. So I cut it off, but those manuals are big. They're like 50 megs, <laughs> you know? So I was like, well, I'll, I'll upload those later. And, you know, I guess Ryan didn't get the manuals or he needed the manuals and I hadn't uploaded them. So, I finally got those uploaded, I think, last, last week sometime. So, and, uh, well, but Ryan, anyway, why don't you take it from there? 
Yeah. 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 Ryan, tell us. Well, was there anything else you wanted to say, Carl? Well, other than I, I don't. Did you did you actually convert? You said something about view calc and view file mm -hmm. that maybe those are done, <laughs> and they work. Well, why don't we stop there well, for a second? Because there will be some people who aren't familiar with what we're talking about. Yeah. So why don't you give like a 30 second overview of what you're working on, Ryan? Well, um, <clears throat> so I was working on a, a utility to convert uh, CX81 programs in the P file into a ROM image for these cartridges. <clears throat> and of course, you always think, Oh, well, that should be easy. <laughs> I just got to rearrange the data in this file into this arrangement, and there you're good to go. Plus, you had a template <clears throat> of looking at the little assembly loader in the existing ROM cartridges. Um, and that works great for those four, four programs that they had done. And indeed, it works great for most normal P files. Except, of course, I then quickly started getting lots of P files that were not normal. <laughs> Which it's not to say that they're invalid, they just seem very unusual. <clears throat> um, and so, but really what it revealed was is that there was lots of little uh, schemes that various programs would use, especially since most of these things are going to be games and commercial software, they'll have various copies. They might have copy protection. I'm not sure what the ones that the view calc and view file programs <clears throat> were doing, if it was a copy protection or what. Basically, they would check some of the system variables which would load with the P file. And so the existing loader, these ROM cartridges would just be a fish space efficient and it just saves the program if that's all it needed. And if the program needed variables, it would save the variables, but it would dispense with the system variables and the display file that normally load the P file. And so programs like ViewCalc would fail because it would do this CRC check that included the system variables and it would fail because it was on, they were not, most of them were not set as they were from the P file. And then, then others were having some format issues and I still don't I still don't know why they work so you remember that game impact that that you spotlighted last time I think David was it or time before or time before possibly it was a modern it game was last time oh yeah yeah uh, from Bob Smith <clears throat> right yes yeah, yeah okay. so you load you load this p file into an emulator it work runs fine but when you look at it as a p file from how it's supposed to be, it's very strange. It's clearly composed by whatever development tool that, that, that he has. Mm -hmm. So like <clears throat> it's clearly composed and not saved from a, an emulation or a real machine, obviously. And <clears throat> um, because, you know, the save command doesn't have an inverted character at the end. Um, Perhaps most curious is that the line that it's auto starts on, um, the key has been the address. It's in the system variables, it stores the address. And this is what the original loaders for these cartridges would do. They would get that address out of the P file and set, make sure they set that so that the program would auto start in the same place it was supposed to. <clears throat> but in these, the, the P file for that game, I found that although the address was correct, for whatever reason, that line number has an extra byte before the, the line number bytes after the end of the previous line. And it's a byte before the address of the auto start. And so in theory, it shouldn't affect it. And, and in fact, it seems to not necessarily care, at least the emulators when they load the P file, work fine, but when I convert that, I cannot figure out why that byte then makes a difference. And so it'll load uh, with, a, with an error, unless I force the auto run to be this other line that does a go to, 
and then it works. And so there's, there's, it's uncovering these mysteries about how the program execution works. Um, and then the various ones, uh, like uh, I think, well, even the original chess game is largely machine code in variables. There's only like a few, only like a few lines of basic, and then it calls a machine code routine in the variables area, and so that loader would make sure it loaded the variables block of the P file as well. And I know the programs would use variables, but you get a lot of these where there must have been some development system that used that would store things in the variables area uh, as a way of maybe. Uh, handing over the machine code to the basic system yeah. back and forth. Possibly. I, I did want to ask people about that uh, when you brought that up too. Like, does anyone know what uh, development system might have been doing that? Maybe on the eighty-one. I don't know. If I don't know if that's. System, I don't know if I... that's how Hot Z worked at all or not. But <clears throat> that's another. <laughs> well, that's, that's another one. <laughs> kind of encompass all of this too is you know that's probably why timex never published any kind of <clears throat> any kind of uh, document as to how to do cartridges for the fit for the 1500 right or the 1000 mm -hmm. um, because i think you know a lot of zx81 stuff because i know i know in the past I've, I've actually bought something from britain i think it was more for the spectrum but it was like copyright you know how to copyright your programs how to hide line numbers how to do all these weird things right and it would explain how to do these things and so it was kind of mostly kind of for copy protection right because it was not normal right these were special things that you did and if somebody didn't understand what you were doing well then they couldn't copy it right they couldn't reverse engineer it and this this manual kind of went through you know, i don't know nine ten twelve different things that you could do to your program that would do this and i it kind of seems maybe they were doing that on the 1000 or the ZX81 as well. And that's why Ryan's running into all these different um, scenarios, right? Where it's like, it's, I won't say that every program needs its own specific loader, but it seems like uh, there are definitely, you know, more than a few programs that do different things, right? So they do need a specific loader for to well, handle. The the way that they're loading the program. Anyway, go ahead. So I was, <clears throat> so where I was going with that was that uh, having the other programs was useful in uh, making the loading more robust. So, um, you know, first I had a generic loader that said, okay, <clears throat> your program could be big and split across the ROMs or your program needs variables. Let's include that. Some programs have a lot of variables or the variables could be split across the other ROMs. And so it does those things, but also <clears throat> mostly it's been in this auto run handling and, you know, the hot Z stuff is doing crazier things because it's having to hide from the system and, or <clears throat> have parts of it survive a new uh, command or something like that. So like mm. it's loader, they found out that, you could actually point that auto start address anywhere and the computer won't really care. They just go there and start running. Well, <clears throat> I think there's other sensitivities that I've, <laughs> I've got to figure out, but basically what they would do is they would put, they would poke a basic line into memory. It was just a RAND user call to call them. And they would put it in the system variables in the print buffer. So that would be saved with the P file. <clears throat> and I forget exactly why that was put there, but then another one does it and it's stored in the variables area hmm. and it points there. So I had all these checks that were supposedly to say, Hey, you know, something might be wrong with your auto start because it's outside the program area. Well, apparently <clears throat> that was going on all the time <laughs> with these machine code programs. So, <clears throat> So where that wound up was, okay, I think I got a lot of the cases and indeed, <clears throat> but then I would, I would go and make the wrong file. And so what I've been doing was loading them up in 81 in a TS 1500 mode. 
they get these, they won't run. And, and most of them would just sit there and crash. And then finally, I just I said, well, what's going on? And I test it and it, and I haven't got, I don't have anything conclusive yet. That's where I got to iterate with Carl a bit is <clears throat> I'll put 81 in a ZX81 emulation mode, load the ROM there and do the RAN user call and it'll work. But you do it in 1500 mode and it'll crash. Oh. And so I'm, I'm kind of at a loss at that point um, well, as to you know, what's I, going on. Well, I think maybe Paul needs to <clears throat> see that kind of information because maybe he needs to update Talking the about emulator. Paul Farrell? Right. Yeah. Okay. For the, 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 well, it's not all Paul's, but I mean, he was the one that did the flight simulator, right? They got, they got that to work. Um, so maybe you're, you're uncovering other, you know, like I said, we, we wouldn't know this un unless we were actually trying doing what we're doing, right? Trying to make files into ROM files for the cartridge. Uh, we wouldn't even know that this was a problem, but I think maybe his emulator is a problem because I mean, essentially the 1500 does exactly that, right? It randomized, it, it goes to 8192 and starts running that machine code, right? Loader that's there. And so if it works in, in ZX81 mode, it should work with the 1500. Mm -hmm. So I think it may be something more wrong with his emulation, uh, what he's doing with the emulation there. Uh, that's why I've actually got you and Adam um, uh, a 1510 clone set, right? The problem with you, Ryan, is you know you don't have the programmer. Um, so we need to maybe no. get you a programmer or I know Adam's got an old programmer that might right. work. Yeah. yeah. That, I mean, like I said, the new modern programmers like 50, 60 bucks, it's not really that expensive, but it runs Windows. You know, the uh, there is a Linux port, I think, of the programming software, mm -hmm. but it's mainly meant for Windows. And I know Ryan really doesn't have a lot of Windows machines at his <laughs> house. So um, <laughs> he's not a lover. So that, I mean, that's the other thing. I think you need to get the hardware of the real cartridge so you can program it on a flash chip and then run it on real hardware and see if it works. That's ultimately the goal, right? So, I mean, if it doesn't work in the emulator, uh, that is a problem, but I think that's more an emulator problem than than a real hardware problem. I bet you if I had your ROM file and programmed it onto a chip and then threw it into my 1500 here or the clone that I'm, you know, the 1000 to 1500 <laughs> clone <laughs> that I made, that it would probably work. Maybe not, you know, and then we could see from there on real hardware if it works or not. Um, so anyway, that, I mean, like I said, I, you know, kudos to Ryan for going through this, but again, it's like, I kind of gave him a list of all these programs that I would like to get converted. I think it was like a dozen programs that I would like to get converted. And, uh, so he started looking at those and that's where he started running into these issues that it wasn't as simple as we thought, <laughs> you know, it wasn't, uh, you know, different programs do different things, right? Like flight simulator really doesn't do anything with variables oh. really the, the 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 well a little bit i mean the machine language header code does do some stuff with the variables area but mostly it just copies the code sets it up to run and then runs it right it doesn't really do any of this other special stuff which i kind of luckily 3d monster maze was that way as well because paul faro he he made that rom file really quickly and maybe Paul's under the assumption, probably is, that most of these P files are similar to like Fight Simulator, where they really don't do any weird stuff like store stuff in the print buffer or in the variables area. You know, I don't know if Paul's aware of that. <clears throat> and um, so that may be why it doesn't work in his emulator, <laughs> because he's not taking that kind of stuff into consideration is all. It could be very well. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. I, something I'm learning um, from talking about this with Ryan in person is um, just how, not about his programming um, converter exactly, but like this Hot Z program, for instance, it takes advantage of the 64K um, memory expenses by Memex, Memtech? Is that what Memotech. It? Yeah, Memotech. Yeah. And I was like, I didn't realize there was that many programs that would do that. And um, it's it's one of them. 
Yeah, and then but, you know, I I guess I don't really give uh, you know Ray credit, but I know he was he was a whiz at, at programming these things. Uh, it's probably not, you know, it's probably a reason why Art picked him to to write the software for the the milling machine, right? Because he knew you know all the ins and outs of the twenty sixty eight and apparently the one thousand as well. Um, but I know there's a sixteen K version that I know that Joe sent right his 16 because there is one on the internet and that's what i kind of posted that link to the forum right on the uk forums they talk about that and that's where i guess that corrupt 16k version came from okay right somebody somebody had packaged it up uh from from that site and uh, that's the one that's kind of floating around on the internet it's not joe's version joe actually should have a, a a real good version of it right and i think that's what maybe was confusing ryan where he didn't know that Joe had his versions also in there, in addition to what was already available on the internet. Because uh, I know there's a high Z, what they call a high Z, which is meant to run in high memory. Yep. Uh, there's the hot Z64, which is like like Adam saying runs on the with the 64k memory, and then there's a hot Z 16k, which is supposed to run in, you know, 16k memory, but apparently it does some trickery to get around hiding itself in there. So if you're um programming a big assembly language program right i don't know that you want it to you know you want to be able to use all the 16k <laughs> so well there's also well, <clears throat> someone go ahead paul yeah there's cartridge board version also that's for the 2068 though we're talking about for the 2068 um Ryan, are you using your uh, 1000 to do any of the programming with or testing with uh, Hot Z? No. Okay. The, the problem with Hot Z is that <clears throat> for a start, uh, the only the 16K version is going to be, I think, viable. Because remember, the ROM carts occupy these are big programs so they use a second yeah. rom so that at rom there's rom at 32 to 40k and so <clears throat> i was having a real problem with that um these because it would get sideways with where it was wanting to use memory hmm. Hmm. okay and uh so i don't know <clears throat> that many of those hot c ones are going to work but, well, they may not. We may have to make a special cartridge for it that has RAM on it. RAM up in that um, area. So, yeah. And so, yeah, I thought about that, but well, even you know, still, the, even because it talks it, about, it, well, it talks about the M1 not, right? You have to enable that in the emulator. And what that really does is that allows you to run machine code right above 32k because mm -hmm. it kind of it kind of it buffers the display you know when it goes to display the display file information uh it it uh is reliant you know that that in and of itself is a whole fucking discussion <laughs> to be honest with you because it's relying on the copies right the mirrors of the rom uh, the to places. be to be well especially in the very upper 8k chunk that's where it has to be the other ones, not necessarily. That's why I think you can have RAM up to, I don't know, E E zero 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 maybe. Uh, but ap yeah, but after that, that last that high eight K chunk has to be a mirror of the ROM because it needs to get the the um, character set. Mm -hmm. It needs it needs to be able to see the character set to know what to display, and so um, that's why I you know you the M one not is basically faking the system out to say, well, if it's below that area, then you can actually use RAM and you can run machine code, but you, you know, it's, it, you have to have something there because you couldn't be able to do it on a normal machine because that, that mod isn't there, right? It, right. You, that's why they usually say you can't run machine code after 32K. You can store stuff, you know, basic programs, and I think you can run basic there, but you can't, uh, you can't run machine code because of that M1 not, because it uses A15. It uses mm -hmm. A15 and the M1 line, and that's how it uh, 
uh, and it's kind of neat if you look at the ZX80, like I said, the, the, the clone that I've made, uh, it actually has buffer chips, or not buffer, they're inverter chips and they're all tied high. And when it's trying to display the file information, it, uh, or it all, it's they're all low. So basically it makes the CPU execute NOPS when it's trying to display the display file. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, it's, it's really convoluted how they do it, but it works. But uh, you know, there's actually circuitry that's in the ULA, right? That forces zero, zero, zeros onto the data bus when it's trying to use the display file. <laughs> you don't you don't see that in the ULA obviously because it's all inside right but on the ZX80 yeah. you see the the circuitry laid bare so <laughs> that's a good point um i want to check in with tim joe greg ada in case any of you guys Want to chat about anything, Tim? Yeah, I wanted to talk about the. Uh, oh wait, wait, wait! Before you start, Joe. Before yeah. you start, let me oh. let me just spotlight you. Hang on. All right, all right. Now, now show so, your shame. There we go. What is this garbage? <laughs> <laughs> well, that's basic from the best computer, eight bit computer of the eighties, right? And that's my April Fool's joke for you. <laughs> <laughs> but no, that that that's Commodore Basic. So it, it's basically just setting a a a black screen with white text. So oh, that's right. I used to know yeah. what those numbers meant. That's the uh... yeah. It's like the right. shortcut for print, and then the numbers. Yep. Yep. Is this different. coming through backwards? It's back. No, no. It's it's. We can it's, read it. Okay. Uh, it's yeah. fine. Yeah. Unfortunately, we can read it. You sure that you sure <laughs> that's print, or I thought that was for like peaks and pokes because poke. there's no. Or yeah, there's no Sorry. Yeah. Poke. Yeah. Yeah. yeah there's sorry. no peaks and pokes on the Commodore. You had to do that kind of funky. Yeah. No, no. Thing. There's peak and poke. That, that's that's yeah. the two characters. Yeah, that's just a shortcut, shortcut for it. Oh, okay. Yeah. Well, I thought there. No. Yeah. Is the is the joke that that's all that there is peaks and pokes? Pretty much. No. No. Yeah. <laughs> Joke is I wore a Commodore shirt too. Oh. Uh, all but, right. So uh, you were oh. gonna say Joe. Yeah, so uh I bought the uh modified twenty sixty eight board from Paul. And uh I've been working on that, trying to reverse engineer. And it has a, a, a kind of a floating and gate to remap or redo the memory. Or I'm sorry, hmm. or gate. So yeah, I've been uh, trying to sketch out exactly what is going on with that. It's kind of kind of an interesting mod. So I'm trying to figure out what all the cuts are on the board, and I'm trying to figure out how they how it's actually working. So I actually had to dig out my my big schematic hmm. <laughs> for the 2068, so I could see it. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. yeah, it's uh, it's an interesting board, and it has a custom ROM that I've already uh, dumped, so I need to uh, upload that to you, Dave. So did you did you look at the ROM to see what it, if you could see what was special? Yeah, there's it? quite a few changes in it. It, it. Not just the standard stuff where you can go in and change your name and that kind of stuff. When it uh, when it comes up, it's it's uh, white on black. Oh, instead of black on white, um, and it has a custom startup message. Huh and uh but there's there's a lot of code changes that i'm not quite sure what they all are but i need to go through them one by one cool uh, it looks like some of the you know standard ones like in the back of the uh the technical the tech manual right you know for, for bug fixes those are in there but then there's some other stuff that i'm not quite sure what's going on there uh but just for fun i, I got it i got it fixed up i got it running um, oh wow so it's 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 a working board now uh, there was just some, I don't know, glitchy RAM, but that's fixed. Uh, one of the things I noticed was everything was socketed. So somebody had, had desoldered everything and, and uh, socketed everything. And yeah. some of the sockets were bad. So I had to desolder the old crusty sockets and put in some new ones that actually worked. So that was another thing. But then once that was done, uh, it, it seems to be working. And it, it works with the Pico with the ts pico okay so when you plug that in <clears throat> of course the pico rom takes over portion right of the away ROM and it, it's it's normal 
black on gray. So, huh? So huh, yeah, okay. yeah, it makes sense. But uh, do you have do you uh, have any idea who who made that board or was the, the message that comes up to give you any idea? It's just, who... it's just some initials. Uh, Paul, do you? What were the initials? I don't remember. I'd have to look oh, it up again. Okay. Yeah. Actually, if you want to go on to another topic, I can go power it okay. up and tell Paul, you. Yeah, Paul, do you recall? Where I you have no board? recollection of his origin anymore. Okay. Okay. And I believe when I got it, it was minus the key top, the top. Okay. Okay, so just the bottom of the case. That yeah, was the bottom with the board and the mods. Interesting. Interesting. Okay. Okay. It might have come from uh, some of the stuff that Basil had. Oh, yeah. All right. All right. Well, do you think I maybe... Think he got some of the leftover stuff from uh, Tom Bent that we didn't get. Oh, okay. Okay. Because he took over Sinkware News. That's right. Yeah. And I've... Yeah, speaking of Tom Bent, I've tried to reach out to him once or twice to see if he could... would be interested in joining us and... I've not heard anything back. Did he tell you get bent? <laughs> <laughs> wow, we're just full of the April Fool's jokes, aren't we? Yeah. But that's not an April Fool's joke. That's a it's good not, solid it's joke. It's not. It's a dad joke is what it is. <laughs> <laughs> Does anybody know if the... So Tom Bent did a... Uh, um, a mod to the JSU ROM. I think called the MGU, I think. Tim Tim would call it. You asked. Do you know if that's available anywhere at all? I'm um, I'm sorry, Tim. Uh, okay. Which we know it's available of, anywhere. Zoned out there. Go go ahead, Tim. So yeah, so Tom Bent did an update to the uh, QL ROM. I don't know if it's available anywhere. Yes. Just curious, anybody knows if it's available. Yes. Oh. Yes, what, Paul? Yes, it's available. Yes, so it's one of the versions that we made a lot of mods and upgrades with. But but is the ROM available? I've got some. Okay. Do you have a thing you to know. read the read ROMs? Or the last piece of hardware I had that allowed me to do that was Windows ninety eight. Okay. Well, well, that's not that old. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's brand new compared to our TS twenty sixty eights and yeah, one thousand. Right, right. Well, you know, Paul, I, I like I said, I want to get some of those keyboards for me, so maybe you could send me one of the ROMs, and I, yeah. I can I can certainly dump it. <clears throat> well, I might send you a treasure trove that you'd have to return because I okay. have an anti-static box full of ROMs <laughs> of various natures, I, I, including the Tom Bent TS one thousand upgrade. Uh oh. I have no idea what that is. It's a. It's uh, a. I think it was all the bug fixes that were known at the time. Yeah, and it doesn't count. Um, it doesn't do the memory check at the start, so it doesn't take a long time to boot. <clears throat> well, hmm. I can certainly dump. You know, like I said, I got three or four of these cheap programmers around, and I got plenty of Windows machines. Believe me. All righty. I like you it. For it. And if you need to send, I'll. You know, if I got to send it back, I'll send it back. Not, not a problem. I like it a lot. Yes, yeah, send it, to, send it to Carl. Paul. All right. Well, there'll be some QR ROMs and some Timex ROMs. Okay. As long as I kind of know what they are, I mean, I can dump them, and, and you know, I imagine they have labels on them. Most of them. Yeah. Just, some of just... them that don't, I'll just uh, say unknown dump. Well, if it's bigger <laughs> than sixteen K, it's probably QL. Okay. Yeah, that would make sense. And I've got a QL now. I still think I'm going to get another one. So, you know, that, that'll that help me later down the road once I get that up and running. Well, we also were uh, selling some of the Minervas for a while. Well, that would be nice. I don't know what's in that QL. I imagine it's a stock ROM. So, Well, like I told you before, if there's an extra stock, it's been through my hands. If okay. there's an extra what? You kind of cut out there. Uh, the switch, slide switch. Oh, okay. Usually over by the uh, ROM port. Because okay. we, you know, a lot of the replacement EPROMs that we did 
uh, we left the uh, top 16K switchable. Mm, okay. Yeah, I can dump them. Okay. Plus, it'll be nice to get some real 1,000 keyboards. That would be, uh, you know, I don't know how many you have or how much you want for them or what we're going to work out there. But, uh, yeah, I definitely uh, uh, would like to get a hold of some of those. I got some car work I need to finance. <laughs> 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 so joe you're back did you did you figure out we'll the... get with you privately on it okay yeah no problem paul thanks man yeah the uh boot up uh message comes up the superior machine mm -hmm. and w period j period that's that's willie jones really, that's willie jones that's willie yeah is it willie's yeah yeah oh yeah. okay <laughs> I, I, you know, I didn't suspect it might be him because he probably would have said something about it. Well, he might not remember. He, he wasn't on the the meeting though, was he? No. When, when Paul was talking about it. Okay, so that yeah, that's that's who did the round. So maybe I need to hit him up and find out what he did. Well, I don't remember when he switched over. But for a while, he used his name rather than his initials. On on his custom boot message yeah okay. okay the superior machine hmm. well yeah, i think wrong. i've got one in the closet that says property of mm. maybe that's a missouri thing isn't isn't the willie from missouri uh uh or indiana. arkansas oh indiana yeah hmm. they still have a, a slightly southern accent in certain parts of indiana <laughs> yes yeah yeah cool yeah, he lived on the far east side. That was the strange part of town. <laughs> what does that mean? There's a story there. I can tell. Let's let's hear it. <laughs> well, let's just say it was a long drive to get from my house to his house. And John Oliver lived on past Willie. In Indianapolis. Yes. So Indianapolis is that big? It sprawled rather than it, it, it sprawled horizontally rather than vertically. Okay. Okay. Interesting. All right. Yeah. And there's another person we need to track down is, is John Oliger and <clears throat> try to get him in here. And if you want well, to have a little fun. About... Go ahead. Uh, Mowgli. Yes, Mowgli. Yes. His parents were Rudyard Kipling fans. Oh, makes sense. That explains it. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah, I don't know if Adam that makes sense to you. It does. I was going to ask, but you know. Yeah, he. Um, this was in the emails today. Um, there was a guy that asked about a former user group in Columbus, Ohio, and um, I don't have. I, it's it's news to me because I I went looking you know at the Ohio list and I didn't see the group that he was looking for <clears throat> but there was another group from a little bit later in time that a guy named Mowgli Asor was involved in and Mowgli also wrote this program that I think was like a sector editor for I think the Zebra disk system but I'd have to double check it might I believe been... it was Zebra yeah okay I would swear to it but I believe so and so um I found his email and and you know sent him a message and we'll see if he'll if he'll join us. That would be interesting if he does. <clears throat> I actually went West. to one of their meetings. What was that, Paul? I actually went to one of their meetings. Yeah. I and remember so going the, to Bryce Road. Uh, pharmacy. pharmacy. The, was the meeting in the pharmacy? Yep. Well Where? that is house. I'm sorry? That and his house. I think we went uh, both places. Was the pharmacy attached to the house or something? No. Uh, Mowgli's house was his house. Oh. Bright Road was another person. But but a pharmacy. Yeah, but it was in a pharmacy. This conversation is getting hard to follow. How, how do you meet in a pharmacy? <laughs> what, what space <laughs> exists in a pharmacy that you meet in? He had a Timex storefront inside the pharmacy. Oh. Yeah. How interesting. Okay. In one corner of the of the pharmacy was all the Timex stuff he's selling. So you'd you'd go hang out in the in the corner of the pharmacy. Yeah. 
<laughs> if I remember correctly. But I remember seeing the setup and its display and the whole corner was full of computer stuff instead of drugs. Right. Well, it's just uh, a different kind of drug. Yeah. <laughs> Well, I mean, um, that sounds like a Radio Shack. Like, there used to be Radio Shack set up like that, where a part of a store was a Radio Shack. Yeah. But Radio Shack was full of computers and electronics, not drugs and yeah, the drug store and and, and whatever. You know, goods. <laughs> Don't question yeah. it. Just go with it, David. Just go uh, with I, it. I, I'm just baffled, you know, because I've I've known about this Bryce Road Pharmacy, you know, and being a a dealer of various you know Timex stuff, and I was just like, oh, maybe it's just bail order and whatever but no apparently you know it's all storefront and you go hang out in the drugstore <laughs> with your with your timex pals so that's that's <laughs> how you that's how you get some of the best programming is when you're high <laughs> is that right so that you're works getting in the 80s drugs played an important role in programming mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> and then like once the you came experience once, and then once you came down or you know, if you had a long program you hadn't saved and you got the ram pack wobble, you got the headache, well, you got a bunch of aspirin. <laughs> ready to ready to get. Ready, ready to go. Yeah, right there. Hmm. Okay. Interesting. Interesting. <clears throat> um, I was also saying, uh, David is uh, Wes Brzezowski or whatever, too. I know we talked about that at some point. Yeah, I'm going to ping Wes. Uh, oops, I'm way off in the future here. Um, I'm gonna ping Wes because he's joined us in the past, and I think he'd certainly be willing to chat with us again. Um, maybe, maybe even for our next meeting. Which, how Good about job, that segue? David? I was just about to say something. How about that segue right there? <laughs> <laughs> Is um, Sunday, April twenty first, at two p.m. Eastern. Uh, and you know, since we've now, I'm only going to say Eastern because I don't know which Eastern we're in now, uh, because of the recent time change. Um, what does that mean? Which Eastern I, that... daylight? Are we in Eastern daylight? Are we savings? Are we doing what? I don't know. Yeah, I think it's DST or EST. EST. All right. So yeah. we're we're in S time. Saving, savings time. Yeah. Yeah. Um, no, it's right. it's standard time. Eastern standard yes. EST. Oh well, then what's the daylight one? D, E, D, S, yeah, T. Where does where so does the savings the come in? So you're in the daylight time, which E, D, T. Okay, it's so it's D instead of S. D is the Got daylight it. time. S is the standard time. There you go. That's how you. So it's either E S T or E D T. <laughs> but not D D T. No. <laughs> what whatever time it is that we are in, it is at two p.m. Uh, relative to the Eastern. So this people. one's three weeks away. Look at that. <clears throat> oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It is three weeks. Holy crap. Mm-hmm. Um, right, because it is the third Sunday and Monday. Right, yeah. Um, and the following day will be Earth Day. So uh, I got nothing for you in terms of connections on that. Because um, I think, cause I think uh, what, just Arizona and Hawaii don't observe daylight savings time, so there'll be... There's some weirdos, yes. And I don't think uh, we have anybody normally comes on from those states so right yeah no well we had that one guy from hawaii at one point um so uh uh i need to get back in touch with uh david all i need to reach out to wes brzezowski um maybe we can get some of those other other folks on um and maybe we can even do it for next sunday so that's for for the next sunday meeting Yeah. yeah tim um did you give us a deadline for submitting stuff for the magazine if we want to get it done this year what's a deadline whenever you guys have material that's when it's available okay okay uh how about how about september 1st that would give us enough production. That sounds time. good to me. As long as you guys have you guys set your time, you know, you guys are now the authors. I'm just gonna be the editor. So whenever you guys have stuff ready, you can okay. set your timeline and get it to me. Oh, as I'll be flying various places <laughs> and haunting you guys. I did yes. want to bring up one thing. I didn't mention it last time, but uh, I did post it online. There is that ZX beta ZX81 tracker software that uh, Andy Ray wrote a while back 
God, almost like not quite 10 years, but quite a number of years back. The documentation was rather horrible. So I actually went through the existing documentation and wrote my own based upon that documentation, my experimentation. So it's now posted on my website. So it's got, it's a more of a, it's, it's a documentation plus tutorial on how to use the tracker. So and the tracker. If you guys requires... got a question, what, know what a tracker is? I do, but what 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 kind of hardware require does it require? Uh, uh, Zonex or ZX Span Plus. Okay, it, which emulates the Zonex eighty one, or also the uh. 81... What the heck is that? Is that a piece of hardware from back in the day or? Current? Yeah, it's basically a speaker that plugs on the back with an AY chip, the same chip as in the twenty sixty eight. So, okay. uh, but is, is it current is player, day or is it from like? No, I know it's it's old. It's olden days. Oh, okay. uh, years ago, yeah. olden days. Um, but the, the ZX Span huh? Plus emulates <laughs> that um, that chip. I think it actually has the chip in it, and a number of emulators emulate the chip also. So you can. I used SZ81. I think 81 emulates that chip. I'm not sure about ZSARX, but the tracker software should work, and all the other software should work on most of those emulators. And if you have ZX Span Plus, okay. And and for those who don't know what a tracker is, I think the player software. I think the player software. If you can get the certain file that was done on a Spectrum, it'll play on the ZX81. Okay. And and Tim, what's a tracker? So basically, um, a tracker lets you do eight bit music. If you listen to the music on the 2060 or the Nintendo, it's all using an AY chip with three different channels. And it's a way of doing that sort of music. Um, I think the best way is download the player software and just listen to the music or just maybe check on YouTube for, uh, there's a guy named Mr. Beeper. Yemers or something. Oh. He does actually, um, I'm not sure what, what his, if he does, because I know there's a Dr. Beep that does, but he doesn't do music. Uh, but there's one guy that does do music for the ZX81 and the Spectrum uh, you know, it has demos on his website. Um, it's all 8-bit sound like you get from a Nintendo or the 2068. So, so um, actually know a little bit about this. A tracker, a trackers, I think, originated on the Amiga. And um, <laughs> the, the analogy is like uh, uh, using a spreadsheet to make music because you have to punch in these you know numbers and letters instead of um right. like what you know we're no used to and you know notes on a stave or <clears throat> the piano roll um is it uh they get the tracker name maybe from like a track a, a, you know like a track recorder or like... no no it, it's it's i think it's one of the original uh packages one of the original programs was was something called it was, it was, was called pro tracker, tracker sound tracker sound tracker mm. Something like that. Yeah, down track mm -hmm. on the spectrum. So, um, yeah. So, uh, so on the Amiga, you know, you you were loading uh, uh, samples and whatnot, and 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 as Tim has said, it's very po they're very popular with the chip tune community. Yep. And uh, you can go find this kind of thing. Um, and I'm just going to put in a little plug for the intersection of two of my favorite things. Miles Davis and chiptunes. <laughs> so back in, oh God, I don't know what this is, probably 10 years ago at least, uh, this guy commissioned a bunch of um, chiptune musicians to cover Miles Davis's uh, Kind of Blue, and it's called Kind of Bloop. I'll put the, I'll put the link in the chat. Um, and it is actually a surprisingly good uh, cover of Kind of Blue. I mean, if you if you're familiar with the Miles Davis album, and you go listen to the you know the chip. Yeah, I think you must have posted that to the group because I I think that's where I might have bumped into that before. Yep. And there's yeah. uh, there's also a really really good compilation of Kraftwerk tunes, but there's not a lot of distance between Kraftwerk and that's Ada. true. <laughs> yeah. So did Ada, did you have your hand up earlier? I, I thought I saw your hand was up. Who? I think it was a thumb. No. Yeah. Well, it was a thumbs up. Yeah, that's true. 
Look like oh, a hand oh, to me. Is he still a hand? <laughs> still a hand. <laughs> but he said, no. Well, yeah, you know, it's either thumbs up on it or all fingers are up on it. <clears throat> all right. Well, gentlemen, on that note, um, no pun intended. If um, if we have no further uh, shouting at each other, we wish to do. Uh, we'll call it an evening. And I'll see you in three weeks. Thank you, guys. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> oh, and cheers. Good night. Evening, guys. Here you go. <laughs> <laughs>